Yeah. Should we start? Yeah. Please. So, good evening, everybody. I welcome you all to this say, another interesting session of what is that is upcoming resident teaching series. So I must thank Dr. Ajit Babu Maji for taking so much of interest in organizing and conducting this program. And I also thank him because today he could manage to invite Dr. Anil Mandal. So most of you might be knowing him. He is a pro gentleman. And in pediatric glaucoma, I think there is no one who can at least reach to his standard by now. So you people are very fortunate to have him with us. And you can interact him, ask him your doubt. We want that there is active interaction between you and the speakers. So today we are fortunate to have it. I welcome Dr. Anil Mandal, sir. To be to be with us uh, this evening, so I welcome you all again. I now request uh, Dr. B N R Subuti, our chief coordinator of this program, on behalf of IJAP, to start the program. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Patnaik. Uh, let me share my screen. One more. It is there. Oh, your screen has been stopped, sir. Yeah, yeah, let me see. No, I think it's gone. Let me just hold one on. So okay now? Yes, sir. Yeah. Full screen, full screen right now. Is seen now? No, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Make it full screen. Okay, sorry. Again. Is it yes. okay? Yes, yes. Yes, sir. Yes. Go ahead. So, yes. Thank you, CSC. Uh, I welcome all to this today's program of IJAP work is program number 11. Today's speaker is none other than one of the famous glaucoma consultant of India, who is very much uh, well known in India and abroad also, Dr. Anil Kaur Mandal. Once upon a time, he was my teacher also. He taught me FECO during my FECO training. So he, today's topic is the congenital glaucoma. This is our team mentor. I don't think uh, we need anything to mention about mentor, Dr. Rajit Baba Maji, one of the pioneer in our, this ORTS and ORP program since last three years. He's always with us, guiding us on uh, this, uh, this uh, postgraduate teaching series programs. So welcome, sir. I'm the coordinator for this program. These are my co-coordinators, Dr. Ashok and Dr. Andar Mishra. And this is the team, President of IJAP, Dr. B. N. Gupta, Secretary, Dr. Suraj Bhattacharji, and the Chairman Scientific Committee, Dr. Samajaj Patnaik. The team has given us this program over the last uh, one year. We are continuing this program under the banner of IJOC. Initially, it was at the banner of our state society, but it has increased its horizon, and now it has become a banner of IJOC. Today's speaker already has been told by our uh, um, and Dr. Savisaj Patnaik, speaker, is an authority on congenital glaucoma, I can say. So, I think everybody knows about him. He is presently at present the senior consultant for glaucoma care at the Ali Prasad Institute, Hyderabad. He is a graduate from Kolkata and come to MD from the RP Center of Ophthalmic Sciences, New Delhi. He was a visiting research fellow in 92 at the Dahoni Eye Institute, University of Southern California, Los Angeles, and W.K. Kellogg Eye Center, University of Michigan, USA. He was also a visiting research fellow with Dr. David Walton at the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary, Harvard Medical School, Boston, USA. His research interests include clinical and genetic aspects of adult and pediatric glaucoma. His other major interests include surgical management of the cataract and glaucoma. We have seen how he does this trab and trab operation in congenital glaucoma, really wonderful surgery by him. He is a member of American Academy of Ophthalmology and ARVO. 
He has been listed in the WHO, WHO bi bibliography. He has been awarded the highest national award of science and technology, the Santi Suru Bhatnagar Award for Medical Science in 2003. He is the first ophthalmist to receive this award. Congratulations, sir. He received Apollo Award for the Medical Excellence for 2004 to 2005. He has published more than 40 articles in national and international journals and published a book on periodic glaucoma by Elsley Science. In 2009, he has been elected as Fellow of the National Academy of Medical Sciences by his contribution to science and technology. And he delivered the Noel Rice Lecture in the annual meeting of UK Periodic Glaucoma Society held in London, in the, one of the first of its kind in 2019. So with these few introductions I introduce, I welcome Dr. Nikon Mandel to our webinar and also I introduce him to you. And uh, next couple of minutes we will be listening to this great person how he manages congenital glaucoma. And our today's moderator, moderator for this episode is Dr. Manish Singh at the well-known also in the Eastern sector and India. He is currently working at the BBI Foundation Calcutta as an expert in glaucoma and cataract. And today's panelists are the four panelists, Dr. Sarmista Bahara, the Associate Professor Vimsar Burla, Odisha, Dr. Devasit Chakrabarti, Senior Consultant at Head of Glaucoma and Cataract Services, Center Site, Calcutta. Dr. Randir Kumar, presently practicing in partner at the District of the Natural Partner, and Dr. Rasi Shyam, associate consultant, Kamala Clinic, Ranchi. These are our panelists. And of course, today's postgraduate students will be participating in this webinar. Dr. Madhusmita Mahapatra from Sankardeva Natural Guwahati, Dr. Sarika Rath from Kims Bhuvaneshwar, Dr. Aishirya Bhatta from Agrawal Sai Hospital, Katak, Dr. Asmita Pradhan Bhimsar Burla. Dr. Ankita Anita Sankla, AIMS partner, Dr. Manisha Agrawal, RIO, Calcutta, Dr. Chitrangada Singh, Hind Institute of Medical Science, Lucknow, Dr. Bharat Mittal, also HIMS, Lucknow, Dr. B. Pravina, um, KMC Varangal, Dr. Sororanjan Basul, RIO, Calcutta, and Dr. Abhishekta Chakrabarti, Asa Medical College. I have seen a lot of interest in this episode by the post students. We will see that how they learn today's pro in the today's program. So these few words, I welcome again all the, um, our panelists, our the moderator and our speaker, mentor, everybody, even the viewers also to engross ourselves with the career talk for another one and a half hours. Thank you. So it's over to Dr. Manish, just a few words. Um, before, before you speak, Dr. Manish, I will ask our mentor, Dr. Ajit Babu to say a few words before that. Dr. Ajit Babu. Uh, thank you everyone actually i just want to share few moments like mandal is very very close friend of me and very dear dear to me so someone said uh, someone can he uh, can anyone match him i need to tell few things about him one during his six years of uh, residency and senior residency he never gone out of a ames campus <laughs> Whatever he wants, I supplied him or uh, his friends, rest of the friends. So such is his dedication. He has emerged as the best uh, resident award. Actually, he has not mentioned. He has several other awards also. But uh, at that time, he was the best. And then come to L.A. Prasad Institute, he, we always shared the side-by-side -side offices and uh, Devashish uh, knows this because he also spent a few years in the Alvi Prasad Institute. Again, not gone beyond Banjara Hills. <laughs> His life is dedicated for care of children. And he has started a service hospital in his village. Because in Alvi Prasad, those days, we don't get so much of salary, but he saved everything for the patients. And his, all the services which are provided in his hospital at the village is a multi-speciality and free of cost, which is very, very tough job. Having working somewhere else with a smaller salary and doing so much service to the society is unimaginable. These things I'm telling because you only see the model of who is publishing and senior uh, academy award and all kind of thing. But there is a lot of addition, additional personality to him. 
Another thing is he is a great lover of Rabindranath Tagore. He already uh, published four books with a lot of uh, poems, which were uh, both both in Bengali as well as English versions. His great uh, blend of personality there as well. And his partner is Dr. Vijaykumari Gotwal, who is an optometrist by profession, but she's equally efficient lady. And all his publications are edited by her. And mm -hmm. both made a great combination. And if you see his uh, memoirs, all the children he has treated till now, if all are uh, now grown adults, and all life sequences of these people he has. That is the dedication he has. If anyone wants to reach his level, who is internationally very famous, okay? In Kanjan Glaukoma, you name one person in the world, that is Anil Kumar Mandal. That is his greatness. And he's very simple. And we should always respect him and emulate his efficiencies so that India can earn more uh, laurels in the science. That's why I always, he's very close friend to me, but I'm proud that I'm close friend to him. Thank you, Dr. Mandal, for uh, giving this opportunity in life to me to become your friend. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir, for the kind words. <laughs> okay, now it's over to Dr. Manish. Dr. Manish. We lost him, I believe. Ah, yes. Dr. Manish. Yeah. Am I audible, sir? Yes, yes. yes Please yeah. proceed. First of all, like to thank all the office bearers of ISO for this honor and opportunity, and especially Dr. Bena Subuddhi, sir. I think we all have spoken a lot about Anil Mandasal, and we can actually have a one and a half hour session only dedicated to sir and his achievements. And for me also, it's a great honor because when I was a postgraduate student around 19 years back, that time also congenital glaucoma was Dr. Anil Mandal. Even now, when I am moderating this session, I feel the postgraduates are so lucky that you are getting to listen about congenital glaucoma from someone like Dr. Anil Mandal, sir. Thanks to IJOC and thanks to the technology we have now, the webinars. So please use this opportunity. Ask whatever questions you have to sir. Don't miss this opportunity. And we have an esteemed panel. Samishtha Madam is there, Dr. Randhi, Dr. Devashis, and Dr. Rashisha Madam is there. So don't miss this opportunity. This is the best time to clear all your doubts on congenital glaucoma. And without wasting any time, I'll request sir to please go with his presentation. Thank you, Manish. Uh, let me share my screen. Yes, sir, please proceed. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Hmm? Full screen kar di jay, Dutch. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. All right. Yes, sir. Perfectly fine, sir. Perfect. So, thank you for the kind words. Um, I am overwhelmed by the, <laughs> uh, you know, already 15 minutes uh, gone. No problem. Don't worry, sir. <laughs> we have additional time. Don't worry. <laughs> Time is there. Enough time is there. Yes, sir. Uh, before I start my presentation, I want to tell particularly the postgraduate students uh, to uh, interrupt me and ask question if you want to really clarify something then and there. I have uh, divided my presentation in two sets of slides. Uh, one is the part one is diagnostic evaluation differential diagnosis of primary congenital glaucoma. And the part two is related to surgical technique, particularly the technique we performed in India. Now let us uh, start the presentation. The part one 
the learning objectives of this part is to understand the classic features of primary congenital glaucoma signs and symptoms evaluation of pediatric glaucoma and the differential diagnosis of primary congenital glaucoma you see the picture here the classic picture uh, is related to enlargement of the cornea that is megalocornea corneal clouding here it is uh, bluish appearance it may be white is also associated with classic symptoms of photophobia blepharospasm and tearing this is the classic presentation and you can see this is the classic uh, picture now developmental glaucoma is associated with anomalies of development as the child is in the mother's womb developing so it is present at birth and the presentation may be so dramatic that even a person who is not having any medical knowledge will able to understand that something is wrong with the eye now types of congenital glaucoma is primary congenital glaucoma which is associated with isolated trabecular dysgenesis that is embryological abnormality at the trabecular meshwork itself where the function of trabecular meshwork related to filtering the fluid out of the anterior chamber through the trabecular meshwork into the slems canal and ultimately fluid drains into the episcleral venous plexus now when there is other associated features in addition to trabecular dysgenesis like iris abnormality corneal problem that is irido dysgenesis and corneo dysgenesis it is more severe form of the disease and this is called secondary developmental glaucoma as i told the classic feature consists of epiphora photophobia and blepharospasm and all related to enlargement of the eye corneal uh, you know irritation of the corneal nerves and the high intraocular pressure giving rise to water collection or influx of aqueous into the corneal lamella giving rise to corneal edema now evaluation of a pediatric glaucoma when the child is cooperative for slit lamp examination is something different but we are talking of a child or a newborn where the parents suspect that something is wrong with the eye the initial examination in the office is partly uh, you know will give us uh, some clue for the diagnosis and evaluation but an examination under anesthesia is an integral part to establish the diagnosis now initial examination in the office be it newborn glaucoma or infantile or late onset glaucoma it will be related to you know uh, assessment of a patient for degree of photophobia blepharospasm and tearing children more than 5 years of age with some training can be uh, you know examined in the slit lamp in the office and if uh, it is not possible sedative can be used mild sedative like floral hydrate so that we can examine the child but for detailed evaluation for establishing the diagnosis and for decision about surgery and then the surgical uh, procedure itself should be done under general anesthesia and for that the equipments uh, required for evaluation are listed here this list has been taken from uh, you know survey of ophthalmology uh, you know article delius and anderson which was published in survey of ophthalmology in the year 1983 in the year 1993 we published a review article in indian journal of ophthalmology july issue of 1993 i'll request all the postgraduate student to go to that because in one place in indian context whatever is more important from the point of view of establishing diagnosis differential diagnosis and surgery has been uh, collected has been collated very well now these are the Uh, instruments and an examination should proceed from external examination to corneal assessment and the refraction if it is 
uh, permissible by the media clarity, then the tonometry, slit lamp examination, gonioscopy, ophthalmoscopy, fundus examination, fundus photography, and ultrasound ocular biometry. All these things should be done serially as it is written here so that we don't miss anything. Any patient who presents with the classic symptoms, epiphora, photophobia, blepharospasm, the diagnosis for, uh, you know, uh, we should think of differential diagnosis of congenital nasolacral duct occlusion, inflammation, hepatitis, uveitis, conjunctivitis, corneal infection, corneal epithelial defect, foreign body, and uh, trichiasis giving to corneal irritation. So this is very important. So we'll have to look for it. Here is a group of patients with different types of primary as well as secondary developmental glaucoma, including Sturge-Weber syndrome, echomatosis, pigmentovascularis, etc. Now, we are usually confused when we come across a patient and in the process of differential diagnosis, we used to remember array what could be the other possibility. For remembering uh, the differential diagnosis, an acronym and the classic uh, book uh, teaching, which was published in the textbook, uh, is written here. Stumped, we are stumped, and that's the reason we should remember this sclerocornea, tears in the desmets membrane, ulcers, metabolic disease, Peter's anomaly, endothelial dystrophy and dermoid, particularly the central corneal dermoid. So if we remember all these things and try to exclude the possibility, we'll come to the final diagnosis. I'm coming to a particular situation, birth trauma, giving rise to a situation which mimics primary congenital glaucoma. Birth trauma can give rise to tears in the chestnut membrane and the breaks are usually oblique or vertically oriented, usually unilateral. More commonly affects the left eye because of the OA position of the fetal head. The forceps delivery is done. Application of the forceps blade can give rise to injury to the eye. And because of LOA position, left occiput anterior position of the presenting part, the left eye is more vulnerable. However, the other um, uh, scenario can also be there. We have seen several patients came with right eye injury. The associated features like abrasion in the skin, subconjunctival hemorrhage, and evaluation of intraocular pressure, other assessment of cornea will clinch the diagnosis. I'm giving the picture here. You can see a newborn baby after about two hours of birth, this child was referred to us by the obstetrician with a note. Uh, the child birth took place in Hyderabad in a nursing home that the patient is having left eye congenital glaucoma and it is for diagnosis and management. But actually, it was not congenital glaucoma. You can see here oblique uh, axis uh, having more uh, corneal edema. There was history of forceps delivery. And you can see the Preoperative appear, pre, uh, I'll say at presentation appearance. Yes, it mimics unilateral congenital glaucoma, but associated swelling of the lead and little subconjunctival hemorrhage, bruising, etc., indicated that it is because of the forceps delivery and not congenital glaucoma. We evaluated the very next day and clicked the photograph. And we have not done anything. Corneal diameter was normal, pressure was normal. And we saw this is the axis in which cornea was molded and folded. And that's why the corneal edema developed. And we prescribed very weak steroid in a tapering dosage of uh, one um, month. And at the end of one month, evaluation revealed that everything is fine, but the vertical scar is there the axis in which the cornea was folded because of the blades of the forceps, obstetric forceps. So this is the classic example of uh, birth trauma giving or mimicking primary congenital glaucoma. 
coming to a second differential diagnosis, very important and probably one of the uh, more difficult situations sometimes, uh, misdiagnosed and sometimes misdiagnosed and operated also for congenital glaucoma. Symmetrical bilateral corneal haze and all over the cornea, the extent of corneal edema is same and corneal diameter is normal, intraocular pressure is normal. And if you can see through the corneal haze after dilatation, optic disc will be normal and gonioscopically angle is normal. But most important differential diagnosis, differential, I'll say, points to differentiate from congenital glaucoma is ultrasound pachymetry to assess the corneal thickness. You can see here, corneal thickness will be significantly higher and that's the way it has to be differentiated from congenital glaucoma. So, congenital hereditary endothelial dystrophy is a very important differential diagnosis of primary congenital glaucoma. Yes, there are rare situations where congenital hereditary endothelial dystrophy, we call CHED uh, acronym, can be associated with primary congenital glaucoma. There are three authentic papers I am aware of of which one paper from King, King Khalid with electron microscopic picture of the cornea and endothelium after keratoplasty proved that there was megalocornea, there was typical haze, corneal thickness was enlarged, and the endothelial study on electron microscopy revealed that it is having feature of endothelial dystrophy as well as features of congenital glaucoma. So in very rare situations, we also published a series of patients where combination of CHED and primary congenital glaucoma was there. Coming uh, from that is a syndrome, mucopolysaccharidosis, MPS. Uh, this is Hurler syndrome. And you can see hazy cornea. And in some situation, glaucoma may be associated with syndrome. The typical skeletal appearance and the typical facial feature and sometimes the patients come with uh, you know enzymatic assessment and with the diagnosis referred by pediatrician or internal medicine specialist more importantly this is a very difficult situation if it is associated with glaucoma because the general anesthesia is very difficult because of the skeletal abnormality or abnormality within the mouth, thick tongue and a short neck and uh, other associated uh, orthopedic abnormality gives rise to very difficult situation for anesthesia. Now, other differential diagnosis related to corneal enlargement may be axial myopia, isolated megalocornea, anterior megalophthalma. So, a situation where it will appear uh, the corneal uh, diameter is more typical appearance of uh, primary congenital glaucoma, but cornea is clear, antechamber is deep, but the pressure is normal. So sometimes the true primary congenital glaucoma can manifest like that, but we'll have to be very careful in differentiating because isolated megalocornea without glaucoma is a non-entity. Now, corneal assessment will include thickness of cornea, corneal diameter, corneal clarity, and most important thing, appearance of, you know, endothelial uh, stress line, or which can give rise to ultimately half strike. Along with megalocornea, a breaking point comes when the pressure of the eye really breaks open the desmets membrane and the fluid accumulates within the corneal stroma. And this is the typical appearance, horizontal, you know, uh, railroad track-like appearance, parallel line. These are the ends of the desmets membrane. And in, to start with, the, this intervening area will be devoid of endothelium and the mm, desmets membrane. With time, what happens? From the margin, desmets membrane is let down, and there is sliding of the corneal endothelial cells to repopulate this area. And a situation comes even when 
it presents with acute hydra of sudden corneal clouding with infantile glaucoma the corneal clarity improves spontaneously but you'll have to really differentiate it from uh, you know um, uh, whether it is related to some other condition because in uh, in a decade of life keratoconus can give rise to a uh, sudden corneal clouding and breaks in the desmoids membrane brittle cornea syndrome has to be uh, differentiated from it typical habstai is like that you know parallel line there may be branching appearance circumlinear or horizontal sometimes parallel to the limbus and this is the classic appearance now enlargement of cornea more than 12 mm at any age is suspicious particularly in the newborn baby where corneal diameter at birth is 10 10.5 mm and there if it is more than 12 associated with classic features of corneal edema hats try the diagnosis is almost uh, reached along with that proper evaluation under anesthesia corneal enlargement uh, you know happens to occur before 3 years of age but the sclera is deformable until 10 years 10 to 12 13 years so even when cornea is not uh, enlarging because of chronic high pressure there may be megalophthalmos and the anteroposterior uh, axis can enlarge or the eyeball can enlarge in all dimension giving rise to higher axial length so in the assessment axial length should be measured now in the refraction myopia is the most common compound myopic astigmatism is the most common refractive error because of corneal enlargement and the axial length enlargement whatever uh, you know dioptric power or myopic uh, you know um, refractive error you assume actually in real world or the real uh, situation the myopia when you do refraction is less than that and this compensatory mechanism is because of several factors as and when cornea is enlarging in primary congenital glaucoma there will be flattening of the cornea giving rise to partly emetropization of the myopic change decrease in length uh, thickness and because of the stretching of the jonules lens becomes uh, thinner and anterior chamber deep and it is posteriorly positioned so deep anterior chamber stretching of the jonules giving rise to decrease in lens thickness flattening of the cornea all these things uh you know together ultimately reduces the extent of myopia you are expecting in a given situation depending on enlargement of the axial length so this mechanism is called emetropization nature own effort to really reduce the uh, extent of myopia now most important thing is assessment of the intraocular pressure very uh i'll say correctly and very scientifically in children under anesthesia parkins handheld aplanation tonometer the basic principle is goldman's aplanation tonometer is the ideal the anesthesia most of the anesthetic agent reduces intraocular pressure now except the ketamine ketamine is a situation which increases the intraocular pressure the earlier you know the moment you are giving inhalation anesthesia when the child is uh, you know uh, symptom i'll say excitement phase is over the first thing not to is to note the intraocular pressure because prolongation or the as and when you are doing examination and an anesthesia and uh, spending time if you do not measure intraocular pressure it will reduce the intraocular pressure drastically on the lower side and you may feel oh intraocular pressure is normal that's not true the effect of anesthesia and that's the reason once the excitement phase of anesthesia is over after intubation the first thing in note to note is intraocular pressure 
glaucoma is because of goniodysgenesis and to understand what is the problem in the trabecular meshwork you will have to do gonioscopy now the problem of gonioscopy in india at presentation first presentation is 60 70 80% of the patients may present with severe degree of corneal edema in which gonioscopy is just not possible in rest of the situation gonioscopy should be done and an assessment should be done of the trabecular meshwork and the angle abnormality the most important um, uh, anterior uh, uh, insertion of the iris directly on the trabecular meshwork that is the angle separation is not happening the iris root is inserted over the trabecular meshwork and the trabecular meshwork is not functioning and the iris insertion is flat or concave and uh, there may be some additional features uh, like a stippled appearance and some classic description of uh, you know peculiar name uh, lochness monster monsters uh, appearance etc et um, you know these are not important what is important is if the corneal clarity permits with a direct gonio lens kepes lens is used here you can see here the typical gonio anomaly of the primary congenital glaucoma the iris is inserting directly and sometimes there may be multiple prominent iris process which is normally seen in 8 to 15% of the situation now ophthalmoscopy is very important but again because of the corneal Uh, appearance and the edema uh, and sometimes scar ophthalmoscopy may not yield much information simply because you cannot really focus the retina or you cannot uh, um, take a good look at the retina because of the corneal scar or corneal edema cup to disc ratio should be measured in children 0.3 or above or asymmetry more than 0.2 is very suspicious careful drawing should be done photograph should be taken and uh, uh, you know uh, for comparison it's very important from time to time ocular biometry is important and axial length in normal infant is about 17.5 to 20 mm but when there is excessive enlargement of the globe you will have to be very careful and compare with the uh, age appropriate value to really understand increase in axial length 22 mm by one year of age is very highly suspicious sometimes what happens because of excessive enlargement of anteroposterior diameter of the lens or enlargement of the globe retina is stretched and there may be retinal detachment which is because if but particularly if the glaucoma is neglected and intraocular pressure is not brought under control in in, in the uh, um, uh, real time along with that sometimes there may be spontaneous dislocation of the lens because the jonules are stretched and jonules are uh, weak and uh, with time the natural history will be the uh, subluxation or dislocation of the lens now ultrasound again is very important most important thing for ultrasound use of ultrasound in evaluation is evaluation of the posterior segment when corneal clarity is not permitting you that one important thing in literature there are cases on record where typical picture of unilateral primary congenital glaucoma or even bilateral primary congenital glaucoma with habstry typical symptoms typical signs like megalocornea habstry corneal edema high intraocular pressure is because of 
dangerous situation of uh, posterior segment tumor, most commonly retinoblastoma in this age group. And if you really miss that, it is a disastrous uh, situation. So it's very important that we do evaluate the posterior segment very well to rule out the possibility of uh, you know, posterior segment tumor or posterior segment uh, anomaly, which can be secondarily giving rise to uh, or mimic primary congenital glaucoma. Interpretation of findings as and when you are gathering information uh, during the examination under anesthesia, you are giving, you are getting plus point for establishing the diagnosis of primary congenital glaucoma. And you are getting some negative things which is there and which is against the diagnosis of primary congenital glaucoma. So you will have to collect all the information to establish the diagnosis. And ultimately, you'll have to come to the conclusion whether it is primary congenital glaucoma or secondary developmental glaucoma and whether early surgical intervention is important. In newborn glaucoma or glaucoma in the infantile age group, one to two years of age, when presenting with corneal edema, it is a surgical disease and surgery has to be performed at an early age as possible. Youngest child who I operated in my life is three-day-old child. The child completed about 15 years of follow-up by now, doing very well. What influences the uh, you know, surgical decision or the decision-making process is the structural defect. Whether it is isolated trabecular dysgenesis or associated other anomalies, of iris and cornea, age of the patient, corneal clarity, diameter, severity of glaucoma, and the systemic anomalies like secondary developmental glaucoma and syndromic glaucoma, like start waiver syndrome, other associated, several other syndrome. I am concentrating on primary congenital glaucoma. If the glaucoma is associated with uh, clear cornea, and the cup to disc ratio is not severely affected, and the megalocornea is not very severe, and intraocular pressure is borderline higher side, probably you can buy some time and put the patient on medical therapy to really see how it is working. But in the congenital, neonatal, and the infantile group, ultimately, Surgery has to be done and surgery has to be done as early as possible. There comes the role of establishing the diagnosis in first examination under anesthesia and discussion with the parents, with the family, how to go about it. Now, isolated trabecular dysgenesis is the hallmark of primary congenital glaucoma. It is highly responsive to surgical treatment. I'll come to surgical treatment later on, either goniotomy or trabeculotomy I have external. Now, in cases where there is uh, iridotrabicular dysgenesis like axonfield rigor anomaly, Peters anomaly, uh, other uh, syndromic glaucoma associated with anterior segment dysgenesis, there probably goniotomy may not be possible. External trabeculotomy may be uh, an answer. Sometimes the uh, you know Peters anomaly particularly uh, may not require uh, surgical intervention. If the intraocular pressure is normal, corneal endothelial problem should be tackled otherwise. I'm not coming to that problem at this point of time. Iris abnormalities should be looked very carefully because when there is iris abnormality associated with uh, glaucoma, iridotrabicular dysgenesis, action field rigor anomaly associated with glaucoma is again a surgical disease and the prognosis of such situation is relatively poorer compared to primary congenital glaucoma. Here is a typical picture, artist diagram. You can see the gonio anomaly. You can see the lens abnormality cataract. You can see the iris strand bridging from the colorate to the um, margin of the corneal abnormality, which is uh, uh, showing corneal edema and absent desmets membrane, classic feature of uh, Peters anomaly and the bridge of tissue, iris tissue, bridging the um, gap between the colorate and the margin of the uh, 
uh, desmets membrane, absent uh, desmets membrane area. Now, when all these things are associated, you'll have to be very careful in establishing, in managing glaucoma if it is there, and then probably at a second stage, ultimately penetrating keratoplasty may be required. Now, children under the age of three years, earlier the surgery, the better. Children more than three years, a trial of medical therapy can be done. This three years is not sacrosanct, three, four, five years. Wherever you feel that milder form of the disease, and associated with clearer cornea, you may uh, start medical treatment and see the response. And then finally decide uh, whether ultimately surgery will be required. Now, when there is corneal clouding associated with uh, very typical feature of primary congenital glaucoma, surgery is the answer and surgery should be done accordingly. If you are conversant or I'll say efficient in doing goniotomy, fine, clear cornea associated with uh, congenital glaucoma, goniotomy can be done. But about 80 to 90 percent of our patient is not really suitable for goniotomy because of the obvious reason of corneal clouding. And there, trabeculotomy ab externo is the answer. And in such situation, we usually add trabeculectomy to trabeculotomy to get a situation of good intraocular pressure control in the long run. Now, corneal diameter, you know, if it is more than 13, 14, 15, the prognosis is poor. One important information, Barkan in his several publications mentioned that even if a surgeon is conversant with goniotomy, and if the corneal clarity otherwise permits to perform goniotomy, there is clear cornea. Just because corneal diameter is 15 millimeter, you should not do goniotomy because the angle distortion or the angle stretching, limbal stretching is such that in performing goniotomy, you may really perforate the globe. That's why goniotomy is contraindicated in cases where corneal diameter is more than 15 millimeter. Now, as I told, <coughs> trabeculotomy ab externo with trabeculectomy, CTT, combined trabeculotomy, trabeculectomy, is the procedure of choice in most of our patients we see in India. In advanced cases, this is the choice. And uh, uh, this is the um, end of my slides, uh, you know, a presentation to talk about diagnosis, clinical feature, differential diagnosis, to really establish and then the decision making process. At this point of time, I think we'll say uh, we'll take some time for discussion, for uh, questions, and uh, maybe some comments before we really go into the surgical part. Manish, any question? Thank you, sir. Graduate student? I'll request any postgraduate students if they have any question related to glaucoma diagnosis. Yes, sir. Any Amash point? Good question. Yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. Uh, mostly glaucoma, uh, when we diagnose a case as glaucoma, it's based on not just intraocular pressure, but we evaluate the optic disc as well and uh, even the visual field. But when most of the children who come with congenital, primary congenital glaucoma and in cases who have a very cloudy cornea, neither we can evaluate the optic disc status nor the angle uh, structures, anything. So uh, shouldn't we be uh, means, uh, terming it as just ocular hypertension or, and not glaucoma per se? Because uh, diagnosis... Uh, or are we diagnosing congenital glaucoma on the basis of uh, presence of the cloudy cornea and uh, uh, other symptomatic features? You know, the uh, question is very important. The cloudy cornea, where we cannot assess the disc, the 
field is out of question in newborn or uh, you know um, early phase of life till say six, seven, eight years even. And uh, gonioscopy is not possible. How to diagnose? The very term ocular hypertension should not be brought into this situation to confuse the issue. Ocular hypertension term should be used in adult glaucoma. The very fact that hypertension means high pressure, ocular hypertension means high ocular pressure. So, but the question is here there is definite pathology. Your cornea is not clear, megalocornea, typical symptoms, you'll have to really assess whatever you can do or possible in a particular situation. Do ultrasound um, to rule out the posterior segment. If necessary, ultrasound biomet um, um, UVM to really rule out any ciliary body tumor or any other uh, pathology in the anterior segment. Iris cyst, ciliary body tumor, dictyoma, all these things, sometimes confused with glaucoma. Now, you'll have to really exclude the possibility to really establish the diagnosis. Here, you are not giving positive clue. You are getting high intraocular pressure. You are giving megalocornea. You are getting corneal edema. You can measure the corneal thickness. That's very important to rule out uh, CHED. And sometimes CHED is very rare situations, although sometimes coexist. So you'll have to be very uh, careful. Now, the typical signs and symptoms and the diagnostic uh, I'll say clue you are getting out of EUA is sufficient to establish and really can decide for surgical intervention. There is no problem. Yes, sir. Thank yes, you, sir. Sir, I, uh, really, it's a good, very good question, actually. Uh, and uh, Dr. Mandal has told you that uh, you should not get stumped. Ah, you should, you should not that. get stumped, yes. If While you, doing you, the evaluation, you should rule out all the stump. Otherwise, yeah. you will get stumped. Okay. Yes. It's really good thinking. Yes. So now the question is, yes, in spite of proper evaluation, detailed uh, evaluation under anesthesia, there are situations where sometimes, you know, megalocornea is not really significant. Yes, mild corneal edema is there. The intraocular pressure when measured uh, in the ideal way in the beginning of anesthesia phase and you are getting a normal intraocular pressure, probably uh, you should not jump into the surgical decision if you have any confusion. You discuss with the parents and probably start medical treatment, see the situation, maybe you can repeat the anesthesia evaluation again after say three weeks or so, three to four weeks and see and then take the final decision. If the corneal edema doesn't uh, clear, if the uh, situation is worsening in spite of treatment, that's a clear indication. There are situations, I'm telling, but that's really rare. Most of the situation, we should be able to establish the diagnosis and plan about the surgical treatment or otherwise. In <clears throat> medical situation, we should not take any hurried decision. No harm in waiting for two, three weeks in a newborn baby. If you wait for any way for surgical decision and anesthesia fitness, you may have to wait for two, three weeks. In a anesthesia in a newborn baby within a week or so is so difficult. So yes. competent setup is required. Competent anesthesiologists are required. Yes, we have done several hundred children within a week. And youngest child I operated is three day old. But the question is, that kind of competent setup from the point of view of anesthesia safety is not really freely available, unfortunately, in our Indian situation. That's the problem. Dr. Madhusmita want to ask uh, a question, Dr. Mandal. Yes, yes. Uh, good evening, sir. Sir, about the case uh, which you uh, told uh, in Hyderabad, the case was referred after just two days after the delivery and in the unilateral corneal clouding was there. 
so in that case sir uh, how to proceed like we'll do a first examination under anesthesia we'll plan accordingly we'll do all the tests like if there is corneal clouding and what is the role of gonioscopy in that case before ruling out that even though there was a positive history of cesarean like force of delivery yes to rule out the other causes or the other differential diagnosis how to proceed like what will be the approach in that case and what will be the say, follow up in that case yes the question is you have got a child unilateral affliction you examine the eye and the adnexa surrounding area very carefully head neck area for such application usually when giving rise to that kind of trauma giving rise to corneal edema and breaks in the a fold in the uh, cornea and the endothelium will be associated with adnexal injury subconjunctival hemorrhage associated uh, symptoms and signs uh, you know lead edema compared to the other side subconjunctival hemorrhage bruising and corneal uh, conjunctival chemosis along with that you measure the corneal diameter corneal diameter you know, when the corneal edema is there for such application i have seen there is a false impression that probably that eye is having megalocornea but when is actually major it is actually uh, exactly same uh, diameter and the question is the extent of corneal edema will be more in the center at the axis where there is cornea is folded or molded the peripheral area is relatively clearer you know that's the situation and along with that the definite history of forceps application that all is very easy to clinch the diagnosis and in such a situation anesthesia examination is important you click the photograph you keep the thing keep all the information noted and because of inflammation forceps application it's good to give a weaker steroid for about 3 4 weeks and then examine in the opd in some uh, patients although for examination for documentation we have done after a month ua examination to really photograph the vertical fold of a scar um, it can be done in the uh, it's not necessary that it has to be done under anesthesia again and uh, the uh, spontaneously the uh, corneal edema reduces but the question is even then you have to be very careful in explaining the situation if the scar is by the side of the pupil or bisecting the pupil amblyopia the call the reduction of vision the photophobia and if all these things are not corrected amblyopia is not treated and particularly when the scar is uh, going through the central axis that's the problem we'll have to be very careful and explaining the situation to the patient मेनली दि कंजेंटल ग्लोकोमा दि कॉर्नियल इडीमा विर यूनिफॉम वेर एज एनी ट्रामा एस्पेषली टू दि कॉर्निया बिकॉज ऑफ बर्थ ट्रामा इज यूजली इरेग्युलर एंड इट विल बी मोर प्रॉमिनेंट इन पर्टिकुलर एरिया एंड एज डॉक्टर मंडल सजेस्टेड दि कॉर्नियल डायमीटर यू शुड आलवेज मेजर विच इज लाइकली टू बी नॉर्मल इन बर्थ ट्रामा Yes, uh, and uh, Dr. Sarika wanted to ask a question regarding general anesthesia. Uh, Dr. Yes. Uh, Dr. Yes. Sarika, can you? So, uh, good evening, sir. Yes. Uh, actually, I have uh, a related question to the uh, PG who asked uh, at first. Uh, when we examine a patient under general anesthesia, sir, so newborn baby or infant, and there is a cloudy cornea. Except for uh, checking the intraocular pressure, how do we approach the patient? Uh, I, I mean, how do we go for the gonioscopy or uh, the ophthalmoscopy or everything else? So, now the question is, you are telling the patient is having uh, corneal edema. Yes, sir. The depending on the severity of corneal edema, yes, in sir. In case of mild form of corneal edema. you apply uh, direct gonio lens capes lens over the uh, cornea and tilting the microscope uh, you know optical axis you can manage to see the um, uh, you know angle but that again depends on the severity of corneal edema moderate to severe form of the uh, corneal edema it may not give much clue or much information there you'll have to depend on other parameters for establishing the diagnosis 
again, very advanced glaucoma, the first picture we showed, there, you know, uh, um, uh, corneal uh, edema is so severe, um, gonioscopy is not possible, fundus evaluation is not possible, but probably strong light pipe, when you apply to the lens during anesthesia examination, you probably get some clue about the chamber depth and the pupillary margin you can just manage to see. Oblique illumination, the strong illumination, the light pipe which is used by the retina surgeon. Uh, sometimes we use in very severe corneal edema at the limbus to see really, uh, you know, uh, putting the microscope lights off from the side, we put the strong illumination of light pipe and to see how beautifully the thing can be done. Even a torchlight examination, strong torchlight from the side, when you are seeing the thing under microscope, oblique illumination can give rise to beautiful picture of uh, appearance of uh, view of uh, iris and the pupil margin and the lens appearance also you can assess whether lens is clear or not. So that's the very simple uh, you know, clue which is to be uh, utilized and obtained. Yeah, Sarika, if you see uh, congenital glaucoma, the corneal edema may not be severe in all cases. Yes. Some cases, all the findings you can elicit. Some cases, it will be very severe where you need to depend on the uh, general anesthesia detailed examination. Certain types, the disc evaluation or the angle evaluation may not be possible for uh, coming to a conclusion. Yes. So you should keep this in mind. Dr. Abhishekta? You want me to ask a question? You say, uh, since the axial length usually increases in uh, infantile or neonatal glaucoma, subsequently, even if we undergo for surgery, the patient will have progressive myopia, sir. So, uh, even under, if, when we do evaluation under anesthesia, we will detect myopia, so we will do nothing for that at that point. Myopia, you know, when you are getting axial length, in relation to other parameters which favors the diagnosis of primary congenital glaucoma, depending on the severity of glaucoma, axial length may be enlarged. But isolated uh, megalocornea, isolated uh, you know, enlargement, axial enlargement of the globe is a known entity. So you'll have to be very careful. You'll have to really assess the corneal thickness. You'll have to assess the intraocular pressure, megalo, uh, you know, corneal diameter and come to the conclusion. Now, in borderline situation, again, do not jump into the surgical technique. You may put in borderline situation where you are suspecting, having suspicion about the final diagnosis, you can put the patient on medical treatment and see the response after, say, three to four weeks and plan accordingly. But when there is corneal edema associated with megalocornea and axial enlargement, the diagnosis becomes straightforward. Yeah, Abhishekta, in this uh, situation, actually, uh, one thing I want to highlight is the glaucoma cupping in congenital glaucoma is reversible. Yes. The axial length, which is increased after the treatment, if it is in uh, real congenital glaucoma, it can decrease to an extent. Yes. It also These two important aspects you need to keep in mind. Yeah. So, so uh, I think multiple. Uh, so, um, yeah, you know, just uh, one more point. Uh, the reversibility Sir. of the optic disc cupping is known in primary congenital glaucoma. Similarly, decrease in axial length and also minimal decrease in corneal diameter has also been reported in case of isolated primary congenital glaucoma in favorable situation when you do surgery, when you efficiently manage and bring the pressure under control. Sir, if I, if I may add one point. Yes. Sir, uh, in regard to this myopia, uh, even after uh, surgery, if we find that the myopia is increasing, then uh, we should suspect that uh, there is a progression of the glaucoma. Sir, yes. Uh, yes. 
like like uh, in cases of post cataract operation be it aphakia or pseudo aphakia particularly say aphakia only cataract operation has been done lens has not been put patient's refractive status is going towards uh, reduction of hypermetropia hypermetropic uh, you know power is reducing that is myopic shift yes and uh, in case here is increasing axial length uh, which does the same thing so progressive loss of hyperopia is a sign of uh, developing glaucoma in an aphakic child similarly progressive increase in axial length giving rise to higher myopic requirement is an indication that your pressure control is not probably adequate you may have to really um, set your intraocular pressure target pressure uh, even lower yes so i think dr ashmita has a question then we can move to the next part yes sir i wanted to ask that uh, as we are, as uh, you had already pointed out regarding the emetropization that uh, follows during congenital glaucoma pathophysiology and also sir when we control uh, the intraocular pressure though surgically or medically sir then what are the factors we need to take in uh, consideration uh, for the refractive uh, correction or the refractive status of a patient Uh, of uh, uh, primary congenital glaucoma or the any question, the glaucoma question the question is very good refraction by an efficient uh, person you know refraction in children with glaucoma associated with habstry sometimes mild corneal scar is a difficult entity you will have to be very careful anisometropia and uh, amblyopia all are because of asymmetric involvement of the eye and one has to be very careful one has to be very careful in establishing the extent of myopia the proper correction given in difficult situation when there is asymmetry of the power is so high you may have to depend on contact lens rather than spectacle power correction you know particularly in unilateral situation sometimes in bilateral cases also the anisometropia may be such that uh, you know routine spectacle correction may not be sufficient and you may have to go for contact lens fitting let us go into the next part of the presentation with your kind permission that's sir so, uh, <laughs> permission so, kya hai aap ah, surgical <laughs> so, uh, surgical options for primary congenital glaucoma the learning objective of this part is to understand the surgical options available understand the surgical technique which we most commonly perform in india and to understand the long term results we know that investigations the anesthetic technique the medical treatment improvement in surgery has improved the prognosis of patients of primary congenital glaucoma but we should if we review the history it's the surgery of primary congenital glaucoma is about 85 years old before 1938 there was no treatment for primary congenital glaucoma in 1936 otto barkan who was in private practice isolated practice solo practice devised this technique for primary congenital primary open angle glaucoma in the year 1936 and in 1938 he published a series of patients who treated Uh, uh, he treated by myotomy primary congenital glaucoma in 1940 this is the standard treatment if we consider that about 85 years of history of congenital glaucoma surgery in 1960 trabeculotomy ab externo came very useful technique where goniotomy is not possible because of corneal edema corneal scar trabeculotomy ab externo is possible because of external approach 1968 trabeculectomy came and in the year 1979 combined trabeculectomy trabeculectomy reported in the literature we in rp center have learned from professor n n sood this technique very interesting dr sood's technique was published in indian journal of ophthalmology in the year 1983 but before that similar 
technique was practiced in different parts of the world, in France, Paris, and in, uh, you know, Maurice Lange in New York actually published this paper. If you go by publication, uh, these are the publications. Dr. Sood's technique was published initially in Indian Journal in the year 1983. 1995, trabeculotomy, 360 degree with proline suture, endoscopic goniotomy, 1997, and here is the situation, 2010, very elegant technique described, fiber optic microcatheter trabeculotomy to do really circumferential trabeculotomy. Extent of uh, metal trabeculotomy is up to about one third of the circumference. But look at the situation in difficult cases, one can perform 360 degree trabeculotomy with the help of a microcatheter assisted circumferential trabeculotomy. I'm not going into the details of uh, goniotomy, Parkin described, and with a needle like knife, incise the angle abnormal tissue so that root of the iris falls back and you are having aqueous to have access into the slams canal and the post canalicular outflow channel is via through normal trabecular measure. Compared to that, trabeculotomy ab externo is an alternative technique to goniotomy. It can be performed in cases of corneal clouding and corneal scar. Anatomically more precise, technically easier, and you don't have to adapt to the visual distortion by the gonioprism. Several publications mentioned superior success rate in trabeculotomy ab externo compared to goniotomy. However, goniotomy has very good success rate in infantile onset glaucoma. Compared to that, difficult cases are probably managed better with trabeculotomy ab externo and in difficult situations, combined trabeculotomy, trabeculectomy is to have a dual pathway. Trabeculotomy to remove the possible obstacle by the gonio anomaly and trabeculectomy to bypass the episcleral venous system. And this dual pathway gives rise to better pressure control in difficult situations. Let me explain the situation of surgical technique with the help of slide. Under a partial thickness, uh, before that, a limber spaced conjunctival flap is raised, a non flap, conjunctival flap. Superficial episcleral uh, vessels are cauterized. A triangular scleral incision is given, and then superficial scleral flap is raised. And most important step is the understanding the anatomy of the limbus under a partial thickness scleral flap. If we go from corneal side towards uh, posterior, uh, that is uh, towards scleral side, a transition zone comes, which is outer landmark of trabecular meshwork. And the sclerolimbal junction is the most important landmark where the classic description is where the uh, white meets the blue, bluish trabecular meshwork, Slams canal waits for you. And under a higher magnification, a gradually deepening incision is given to cut open the outer wall of the Slams canal so that you can do trabeculotomy with the help of metal trabeculotome on each side. Once the 80% of the probe is inside the canal, you rotate, disrupt this segment of the corresponding segment of the trabecular meshwork, and uh, uh, you know, so that in this part, the aqueous has access directly into the Slams canal. Once one side is done, similar technique is done on the other side. When performed in each side, approximately one third of the angle is taken care of. And after that, the deeper trabecular block is uh, removed to complete the trabeculectomy part of the operation. Then the iridectomy is done and then superficial scleral flap is closed with 10 on nylon suture, one at the apex, one on each side. After 10 years of my work at LB Prasad Eye Institute, I really uh, do not give side suture, use triangular scleral flap and for closure, I use a uh, you know, one suture with 10 on nylon at the apex of the scleral flap. 
I do not believe in using mitomycin or 5-FU in the primary surgery. Several surgeons abroad and in India do use. My uh, argument is in the first surgery, if we perform very well, success rate is good. In second surgery, sometimes I repeat surgery, I do use weak, weak mitomycin for shorter duration, but I am very much against using mitomycin in the primary surgery because of the obvious reason, blood-related inflection, endophthalmitis, it ranges up to 17 to 20% in the long run. Here is the suture closure. You can see the PI, the typical post, uh, uh, you know, surgical uh, schedule is topical antibiotic for a week, topical steroid in tapering doses for six weeks, and cycloplasty, cyclopentolate for about three to four weeks. Anyway, here is the appearance of the blab. If you do not use mitomycin, the blab appearance will be such that even if bacterial conjunctivitis happens, infective conjunctivitis happens, this do not go inside to cause blabitis or blab-related infection and endophthalmitis. There are several patients I saw, my operated patient, even after bacterial conjunctivitis, nothing happened. But I feel if we use myomycin intraoperatively, the blab quality will be such that it can give rise to infection and endophthalmitis following bacterial you know, conjunctivitis. You can see the PI, you can see the uh, Habstai. I am playing this video. Hopefully the video will run. And A central radial incision is then made across the scleral spark. The objective of this radial incision is to cut the external wall of the slams canal and to avoid entering into the anterior chamber. This is the most delicate step of the operation and demands most microsurgical skill. The next step is to perform trabeculotomy on each side of the radial incision. Once 90% of the trabeculotome is in the canal, it is rotated into the anterior chamber and the rotation is continued until approximately 75% of the probe length was entered into the chamber. At the situation, the condition developed in a three month old child but the parents feel that the child is having beautiful eyes. It is actually megalocornea. At a three month of age, sudden corneal clouding giving rise to acute eye drops. And uh, I'm presenting yes, the uh, appearance of the cornea, how it changed. Compare and contrast the appearance of the left cornea at presentation and at two weeks, two months, and six months after the surgical technique. Note the clinical appearance of the Habs trie in this child. You can see how beautifully the corneal edema cleared. Now you oh. see the behavior of the child. Catching my gaze with limpid eyes, his mother's arms he refuses to see. With appealing eyes, he speaks the language of his soul. The faces lit up with smiles, a radiant beam on the baby's face. Each little one, not a patient, but like my own child, does seem. Little James are tomorrow's dreams. I cherish their budding beam. You have seen the appearance of the child. I think my and uh, it is so dramatic improvement. Yet another case who presented similarly with unilateral infantile glaucoma giving rise to acute corneal hydrops. We operated and the letter photograph 1D was taken 10 days after the operation. How dramatically the thing improved. And you can see the hab style now. Here is the child, the first child whose video was shown. The image was published in New England Journal of Medicine in the year 2013 
and I presented a copy of that to the child who completed 11 years of follow-up just to inspire the child to do good study and I inspired him to do the medicine in future. Let us see what happens. In this connection, I must say that my last count is seven postgraduate of my operated children in the 33 years, seven completed postgraduate medicine like psychiatry, dermatology, anesthesia, general surgery, pediatric medicine, etc. 13 uh, patients now are practicing dentistry, five PhD and several teacher, engineer, lawyer, journalism, chartered accountant, etc. So satisfying. Now, the eighth child, uh, whose photograph is not here, entered medicine recently, first year. The child is from Hyderabad. I operated at the age of, uh, I think, two months. And the unilateral affliction, the child started first year MBBS in um, Hyderabad. I was talking about the Professor Sood's first publication, 1983. Although my personal communication with uh, him, I came to know that he was doing this surgery from mid-1970s. Obviously, the other group who, who published their results in 79 also was doing similar uh, results, similar technique, and published relatively earlier. But there is no doubt Professor Sood is the pioneer of this surgery and father figure of glaucoma, particularly congenital glaucoma in India. Now, in 1994, British Journal of Ophthalmology published an editorial which really talks about Professor Sood's words and the impression we, which we got from RP Center. Combined trabeculotomy, trabeculectomy may represent the next step in the search for the best surgical treatment for congenital glaucoma. Here is a situation, 14 and a half years result published in 2007, prolonged IP control was achieved and 42% of the patient gained normal visual acuity. I am presenting this. 1,128 eyes of 653 consecutive children operated over a 20 year period by a single surgeon were analyzed. Kaplan Mayer survival analysis showed reduction in success rate over a period of time. Success rate of 93.4% at the end of second year decreased to 69.8% at the end of 10th year. Best spectacle corrected Snellens visual acuity of 6 over 18 or better was achieved in 27.6% of the children in whom operation was done for the first time by us did relatively better compared to the children who underwent second surgery. Children in whom corneal clarity was normal did relatively better compared to the children who had corneal edema or corneal scar at presentation. Children who had congenital glaucoma at birth did relatively poorer compared to infantile and juvenile onset developmental glaucoma. A child presented to us with acute high drops because of infantile glaucoma in the left eye was operated by the technique. Six months postoperative appearance revealed total clearing of corneal edema of the left side. So I am giving few more examples. Um, this child, simultaneous bilateral primary CTT was done at the age of three weeks. You can see six months postoperative appearance showing clear cornea, pupil, and the child is enjoying normal vision with spectacle correction for myopia. Here is the child I was talking, third day old child, uh, three day old child we operated and simultaneous bilateral surgery was done. You can see here six months appearance, clear cornea, the child is doing very well. A series of patients who were operated, uh, you know, by me over a period of, uh, you know, ten, first 10 years is presented here. This child from Eastern Jordan, Calcutta actually, 
operated at the age of two weeks. Simultaneous bilateral surgery was done. The child seen at the age of 12 years and the child seen at the age of 25 years. This child did, uh, you know, journalism from Santiniketan and he's doing job in Calcutta. Yet another child from Calcutta, simultaneous bilateral surgery was done practicing chartered accountancy independently, completed about, by now about uh, 28 years of follow-up. So this is the situation. So if done properly, I have given the best example, but there are situations where multiple surgery are required. Sometimes in spite of surgical treatment, you know, the results are not that good because the very fact is it's more severe form of the disease. Integral part of the management should be evaluation in the low vision department, center for sight enhancement and visual rehabilitation. That should be the mm, role. Some of the children will require education in the integrated school or well system of education. And uh, what we have done in the, over the last uh, 33 years, my work, we developed an integrated approach, integrating child's medical, surgical, genetic, and rehabilitation approach to give the best chance for good vision in both eyes and in difficult situation, proper direction for the children and for the family, respective family, so that each and every afflicted child will become a contributory member of our society. I just wanted to tell uh, two quotations. One is, uh, I used to, uh, you know, do surgery with the intention. When I approach a child with developmental glaucoma, it inspires two feelings in me, affection for the way he is now and respect for what he or she may one day become. The other quotation is, a few decades from now, it will not matter what my bank account was or the kind of car I drove or the sort of house I lived in but the world may be different because I was important in the lives of few children. If we really see the changing trend in the management of surgical, uh, you know, cases of primary congenital glaucoma, changes has happened from goniotomy to trabeculotomy to combined technique to uh, 360 degree trabeculotomy and then microcatheter assisted trabeculotomy. But I feel a technique which we added in the literature in the last year, a new technique combined, I, I gave the name IMPACT, Illuminated Microcatheter Passage Assisted Circumferential Trabeculotomy and Trabeculectomy. Later, in this year, I have sent the video to ASCRS and uh, World Ophthalmology, um, uh, World Congress of Glaucoma, naming the situation according to my name, MANDAL. Uh, microcatheter assisted novel distinctly advanced luminous technique. When time permits, probably I'll share my new technique in a separate uh, forum someday. It's a the uh, basis for this technique is I interacted with several international authority. When we do combined, uh, you know, 360 degree trabeculotomy with the illuminated microcatheter. Internationally, authorities feel that this is the summit. This is the highest thing we can do for an, um, a patient of congenital glaucoma. All 360 degree of the abnormal angle has been taken care of. But look at the situation. In advanced cases, you are making an arrangement for the aqueous to come to the Slems canal. But the post canalicular outflow has to depend on collector channels, aqueous veins, and ultimately it has to drain into the episcleral venous plexus. The distal part of the outflow system, post canalicular outflow system, if it is not uh, functioning properly, which is very, uh, very much likely in advanced cases of primary congenital glaucoma, there your surgery will not work very well. And that's the reason I feel that there, there is some scope for adding trabeculectomy even when you are performing circumferential trabeculotomy. That's the argument. The paper was published in the last year in uh, Seminar of Ophthalmology, and uh, the video is there in the 
by the American Academy of Ophthalmology presented uh, in the American Academy also. And uh, when time permits, we'll talk about that later on. This is the advancement uh, which has happened from our side, and I'm not uh, going into that. But as of now, combined trabeculotomy, trabeculectomy is the most successful treatment. But in repeat surgery, there is chances trabeculectomy with mitomycin and tube implantation, uh, be it uh, amid glaucoma valve or Adi implant. These are in the refractory cases of glaucoma when primary or first or second surgery failed. In difficult situation where there is very poor visual potential, transcleral psychophotocoagulation equivalent to cyclocryotherapy or cyclo ablative therapy is the way to go. Whatever we do, the basic uh, aim is to control the intraocular pressure, to preserve the existing vision, and if it is possible to improve the vision by all possible means, that is the way an integrated approach should be done to really help the patient and the family. Thank you. I'll uh, conclude here. Any, any question or any comments? Yeah, yeah. Madhusmita, Dr. Madhusmita wanted to ask two questions, I think. She has. Mm -hmm. Dr. Madhusmita? Can Just I unmute you? Yes, sir. Uh, sir, there was uh, one video. Uh, uh, which was presented in UK PGS from our institute, uh, comparing about uh, the ease of the procedure between a novice surgeon and an experienced surgeon. So mm -hmm. there they have shown that uh, when we introduce the trabecular tome, so with respect to the eye, right eye or the left eye getting operated, is there any specificity like for the left eye, we should first apply the left trabecular tome. It is easy to apply the left and then the right, or is it the same, sir? Just uh, over the procedure, like ease of applying. No, it, it, it doesn't matter. The question is, trabeculotomy should be done on each side of the radial incision, which is uh, used to explore the slums canal. Now, if you are conversant, you can use the uh, trabeculotomy to do the left part of your uh, surgeon's uh, side, trabeculotomy, and then the other side. But the problem is, the moment trabeculotomy, metal trabeculotomy, harm trabeculotomy is done on one side, there is aqueous uh, drainage, chamber becomes shallow, the second pass or the second half of the trabeculotomy on the other side is relatively more difficult. The question is, whatever way you are comfortable, you should uh, do, but utmost care should be taken to maintain the chamber depth. And for that, the practical clue is Superior rectus traction suture should be released, should be loose so that there should not be any undue traction or pull on the globe. So that when you are doing the trabeculotomy part, there will not be too much of aqueous runoff from the anterior chamber. That's the uh, clue. And the, your speculum, your overall surgical uh, management should be such that when you are doing trabeculotome on one side, the second side also should be done very carefully and comfortably. And after that, the trabeculectomy and then the iridectomy part. Whatever you do, shallowing of chamber is invariable. It will happen, but it is the surgeon's uh, you know, choice or the surgeon's, I'll say, practical clue which he or she uses to maintain the chamber depth. I do not believe in using intraoperatively viscoelastic in the anterior chamber that will cause more harm than good actually, inflammation and a sticky situation, which I do not prefer. You do the trabeculotomy, trabeculectomy, uh, closure of the superficial scleral flap, then the conjunctival flap. You will realize when you are doing very scientifically, the chamber depth is becoming better with time right on the table. That's the way to achieve that surgical expertise and the surgical I'll say efficiency. Yes. Sir, yes, sir. Uh, one more query was there, sir. Uh, it was uh, over the shape of the scleral flap which you're doing, sir. So is there any difference, like if you do a triangular flap or the rectangular flap? Not really. The... Doesn't, doesn't matter. Uh, be it in trabeculectomy isolated or even combined trabeculotomy, trabeculectomy, shape of the superficial scleral flap doesn't matter. The reason we do triangular scleral flap, it is easy. You are dissecting relatively 
smaller area of the sclera and the closer and the surgical steps become easier. When you are doing a quadrangular or rectangular flare, your dissection you will have to do very meticulously to really do the dissection. Here, holding the tip of the superficial sclera at the apex, you can carry forward the dissection very, very nicely. That's the, that's the way I, I do. Thank you. Sir, I have a question for our panelists also. Dr. Rashi, Madam, and Dr. Randhir is there. So if they can share their practical tips about how they check intraocular pressure for pediatric patients. Because as Sir has mentioned that Perkins is important, but a lot of time people are using tonopan and rebound. So Dr. Rashi, Madam, what is your take on this? Uh, Dr. Manish, in our OPD, we have eye care. I know it is not very accurate, but at least it gives some idea. So eye care tonometer I use and uh, uh, with very small baby, since I have the previous model, the stylus falls off if you are holding it down on the baby and the baby is so fine. So generally what I do is I ask the mother to turn the child to a lateral position, like left lateral or right lateral, whatever the eye is so that the eye position becomes vertical and then I hold the eye care vertically and do it with that. So generally it gives a pretty good idea if the IOP is raised. And then of course on the table, then I use a Perkins. So for OPD, I can do that. And child, little bit, we have to open the eyelid and we can pick up the pressures. So initial, even if anesthesia is being planned or the baby is just one or two days old and you want to wait, at least with eye care, I have an idea of how much the IOP is. <coughs> And whether I should try some medical management and wait it out for a few weeks till the child is stable for anesthesia. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Shamishtha, madam, uh, in patients where you have to use medication, like we are waiting for surgery or after surgery, the pressures are high. What are your choice of anti glaucoma medication for pediatric eyes, pediatric patients? To be very frank, in our setups, we hardly uh, happen to treat them because we do not have uh, machinery at our government setup for uh, taking proper care of the patient, say, even to measure the IOP. So we do refer them to our nearest LB Prasad Institute for better care. I think that's a very good approach because these patients definitely need a combined approach of a glaucoma consultant, a pediatric ophthalmologist, a corner consultant. Dr. Randhir, anything you'd like to add of some practical tips for the postgraduate students? Because you are very I good think, pediatric ophthalmologist also. So what has I, been your... I, yeah. I think, uh, uh, well, uh, being in private practice, it's very difficult for us to manage these kids because it needs rather, uh, uh, it needs a cornea specialist also. I mean, uh, because most of the time, the uh, if the cornea doesn't clear, we have to uh, resort to the uh, penetrating keratoplasty. So what I feel like that if if our suspicion is too high and if we are not even not able to do EUA, and we uh, we we are confirming it to be a congenital glaucoma, we can start one medication at least. And the preferred choice for me is uh, is Timolol. But then very important is to explain the patient to occlude the uh, uh, puncta. And punctal occlusion is very important uh, to be explained to the patient. And um, we have been doing in RP Center also that we prescribe uh, this uh, Diamox. We uh, we make a, a one Diamox can be made into eight parts and then we can uh, give them a Diamox for the time being, the, till the time the patient goes to the higher center and get his surgery done. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Dr. Devashi's... Uh, I think you do a lot of trabeculotomy and combined surgeries. So till what age you do a trabeculotomy and after what age you think just a simple trap should work? Is there any cutoff in your practice? No, I, uh, I don't have a specific cutoff, uh, cutoff age. But in general, uh, children who present early uh, and it's a pure case of primary congenital glaucoma, uh, we would prefer... Uh, the combined trabeculotomy with trabeculectomy, as Sar has just mentioned. Uh, but for uh, secondary glaucomas and for children uh, who present at a later age, uh, then this uh, th this technique might not work, and we might have might have to go for uh, some other surgical techniques. Uh, so uh, I don't think there's a specific uh, age beyond which you cannot do trabeculotomy. 
and uh, i've seen uh, sir perform a, a, a trabeculotomy in, in in some older children also maybe 5 years 6 years 7 years uh, and they work pretty well uh, i would like uh, to um, uh, ask uh, sir uh, what is his uh, opinion regarding this yes uh, when there is developmental basis uh, even if late presentation you can do uh, combined trabeculotomy trabeculectomy uh, in, in uh, congenital infantile and late onset glaucoma also there is no problem. I have done several children in uh, teenage uh, age group also. The question is the ease of dissection and uh, identification of this lens canal. Sometimes in uh, uh, you know elder children, children who are relatively older, lens canal dissection becomes relatively difficult. I have, I have this is my personal experience. Thank you, sir. So and also in, in uh, Manish, I would just like to say, so in uh, nowadays the trend is to go for the MIGS in adult glaucomas. And there you see that uh, we are again going back to the previous old theory, like the gap where you are treating 360 of the stem canal that is even being practiced in adult glaucomas. So uh, I think whenever there's an opportunity, it, it might work for children also. Yeah. Thank you. Manda sir, related to this, I'll say we do get a lot of effective glaucomas in our practice. So in these patients with effective glaucoma where the medication is not working, what is your preferred surgical option? We have explored this area. <clears throat> effective glaucoma, particularly glaucoma following congenital cataract surgery, is the most refractory or most difficult form of glaucoma according to my experience. We have done trabeculectomy with or without mitomycin, we have done implant, but realize that uh, the trabeculectomy with or even uh, without or even with mitomycin or antifibrotic therapy, the success rate is relatively poorer. Compared to that, probably implant uh, have an age uh, over the um, uh, standard trabeculectomy with uh, antimetabolite. So that is the uh, standard uh, teaching, that is the standard way the world of ophthalmology is going. The aphakic or pseudo glaucoma implant is preferred over actually trabeculectomy. Thank you, sir. I think before we end, I think we have one question from Dr. Sarika. Dr. Sarika, please ask your question. Dr. Madhusmita has asked one question there. Uh, yeah. In the, Madhusmita, I wonder Sarika. Yeah. Uh, Sarika first and then Madhusmita. Uh, sir, actually, I wanted to know if a uh, uh, newborn presence with uh, congenital glaucoma and congenital cataract together, what will be the best approach uh, like to uh, achieve a good prognosis? Sir? Like uh, we should address both the condition together or it should be a separate surgery? Or how I, we should approach the patient. What, what, what do you feel? What is your impression? Sir, no, like. Good, good. You should answer. Yes. You, you should also what have you your own about opinion, it? right? We can, uh, uh, like, uh, we should uh, uh, remove the cataract and we should do a trap together. And later on, we can go for a secondary IOL implantation, sir. Uh, if no, should never be done. In children, newborn babies, cataract and glaucoma should never be combined. Even if there is total cataract associated with congenital glaucoma, which is a rare occurrence, sometimes happens. My personal view is I am very much against doing cataract and glaucoma surgery in children, particularly in the neonatal age group. It has to be glaucoma operation first, stabilize the intraocular pressure, and then perform cataract surgery at a later age. If it is bilateral cataract, probably from the point of view of amblyopia, you are having better situation. In unilateral cases, do the glaucoma operation as far as possible, as early as possible, and then do cataract operation maybe after six weeks or so, when the intraocular pressure is controlled. Now, anyway, in isolated congenital cataract, the trend or the scientific understanding has improved that earlier the better that is not so the moment you do cataract operation in a week old child or two week old child invariably this patient will develop severe glaucoma you wait for about five to six weeks 
And that is the ideal age to intervene from the point of view of congenital cataract. When combined, do glaucoma surgery as early as possible. Wait for the corneal clarity to achieve intraocular pressure to settle and then do cataract operation at a later date. Thank you, sir. sir. Dr. Madhusmita, I'd like to ask you a question. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, sir, actually in those cases where the child is already mo more than three years old and the child was on medication, then we have planned for the trap surgery when the IOP is not getting control. So after a failed trap, sir, before, after the age of three years, should we again approach for the re-trap or should we again start the medical therapy? What is in the first surgery done? First, sir, it's done combined uh, trabeculotomy plus trabeculectomy. Yeah, the way we do is uh, when the combined surgery fails, we used to assess the level of intraocular pressure, supplement with medication, then reassess the situation. When medical treatment supplementation is not doing very well, probably second surgery is required. <clears throat> there, my preference is to go for trabeculectomy with uh, anti-metabolite, very judicious use, percentage of uh, the concentration, the application time. I prefer 0.2 milligram for about uh, half a minute or so, not more than that. There are situations where people prefer, prefer 0.2 to 0.4, even 1 to 2 minute. My personal view is 1 to 2 minute is very long time. I personally use uh, for half a minute and uh, use precaution, wider area of application, uh, the way, um, you know, the Moorfield's uh, safer technique uh, described for use of mitomycin in primary uh, surgery. That's Sir, the in way medication, uh, should we uh, start with all the four molecules of AGM or should we again start? No, the question is, you can start medication, but when you are requiring multiple medication, multi ultimately it is going towards uh, another surgery. You'll have to decide. And for medications or multiple medications, how long can you continue? And uh, not a practical option. You'll have to plan for second surgical uh, option. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And one more thing, Dr. Madhuspita, you should go step up approach. Don't start uh, for yeah. uh, medication at a go. Yes. And <laughs> as uh, you know, all the uh, less than five years, you have to avoid brimonidine. I rest, yes. I think we can use other drugs. Yes. If we don't have any other question, I think we can ask Dr. Bena Subhuddhi sir to give his concluding remarks. And thank you so much, Mandal sir. It is... Uh, yes, we, uh, we, exceeded time. We, we exceeded time. No problem from my no side. Problem, no problem. No problem. <laughs> Academics, there is no time limit. No problem. No time. problem. Yes, it's yes, a yes. wonderful discussion is going on. So yes. time is not a constraint. Yeah, constraint at all. Dr. 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 Babu. Yeah, uh, this is like classroom. In the future, we'll plan <laughs> some. Yeah, nice to see so many postgraduates uh, asking questions. The trend of surgical techniques changing over a period of time. Uh, uh, we, can, we can discuss surgical options, how yes. the trend is changing with time, with decades, for the management of uh, you know congenital glaucoma. We'll discuss someday. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Right. So wonderful time we had today, sir. So it's a really, we listened to you many times. Of course, we have listened to you, but uh, now I think we've seen the updated version of your talk. Yes. And uh, first Thank time you. I've seen that most of the PhD students have come forward to yes. ask questions. You know, that's very, I mean, uh, encouraging for all of us. Yeah, the, please, the, all of you be on uh, video mode. Because <laughs> uh, a lot of people are there, but everyone is off, uh, turned off their right. videos. Right. So, uh, to yeah. conclude, to conclude, I think the interest was not that much for adult glaucoma. No, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> if I, uh, good speakers are coming for uh, adult glaucoma also. Please <laughs> yes, wait for that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, our president, Dr. B. N. Gupta, joined. Have you joined, Dr. B. N. Gupta? Are you there? I think he's not joined. No, no. So, uh, I think let us uh, close this program before I close. Um, I, I will ask Mr. Anmol to play a video which is our, for our host, Hunter Pharmaceuticals. Mr. Anmol, I will...
So may I request uh, Dr. Sabesh Patnaik to say a few words and give the vote of thanks? Thank you very much, sir. But any amount of thanks, I think, will fall short of the way that Anil Mandal simplified and explained to all of us about pediatric uh, congenital glaucoma and what is the objective of this course also that he highlighted and ultimately he proved that whatever he highlighted uh, in a bullet point, he could achieve that. Thank you very much, sir. We are extremely obliged. The ISOC is also obliged to you for your so much of uh, showing interest in our program. Thank you very much. I must thank Dr. Ajit Babu once again for his dedication and interest for the development of uh, the residents of Eastern India region. For that, uh, any amount of thanks also concert. And my sincere thanks to my teacher, Professor Vienna Subodhisar, for taking so much of interest every week, conducting one or another program for our fellow students and residents. And thanks to Dr. Manis for taking so much of interest in moderating the session. And he made it so active. And he ensured that the, all the panelists actively participate in this discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Manis. And last but not the least, all the residents who have participated in this program, they deserve special thanks for the interest and for the question. Now, I am, what I am observing is gradually they are opening up in asking yeah, their much. thoughts and clearing. They are very own. happy. Yes, yes. Actually, this is what is wanted out of them. You yes. have to, you, you don't think that the question is irrelevant or idiotic question, whatever comes to your mind. You just ask because this is the opportunity you are getting to ask anything you can. Because otherwise, it is very difficult to get such a scope later on. So, thank you very much. I again, once again, I want that you should also sincerely participate in our all future programs. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thanks to all the panelists. And ultimately, thanks to the entered who is supporting us continuously for providing us the platform. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Sabasachi. Just a comment. Uh, if this presentation creates some interest in the junior generation of ophthalmologists or the trainees or the postgraduate students, I'll be obliged. I'll be very happy. Because yeah. to, to take care of a child with congenital glaucoma today, it takes two to three generation of ophthalmologists yes, yes, to, yes. Have to give lifetime care for that child. It's a disease which requires lifelong care. And if we consider a person's active professional life is about 25, 30, 35 years or so, it, uh, the child will live up to 80, 90 years. And uh, two to three generations of ophthalmologists are required to take care of a child of newborn glaucoma. There comes the role, our role, our I'll say responsibility of creating interest in the junior generation of professionals so that they will take this lead and they will uh, develop interest in treating difficult disease like congenital glaucoma. Mm, thank, thank you very much. Mandel, what very is your very... score now? Uh, How the... many surgeries now? <laughs> he uh, accounts in each and every primary, case of congenital glaucoma. Prim primary, secondary, syndromic, uh, it uh, just exceeded about 4,000 uh, cases. See? Yeah. Excellent. Excellent this number. is my, 30, this is my 33rd number. year. Yes, into the congenital glaucoma. <laughs> so, Excellent. I think that's actually what I learned is most of the time when we see this type of children, you know, we, think, we, we think that it is gone case. There is nothing can be done. Uh, At least there yeah, is that's the situation. Nothing can be done, should never be used. Lot of things yes. can be done. If One not is. for the child, I, at least for the child as a whole, for yes. the rehabilitation, for the education, mm -hmm. proper guidance for the family, that's very important. So the youngsters should know so, that when you are seeing a child with cloudy cornea, you expect or you anticipate or you think it is a type, is a, is a congenital glaucoma, then at least you refer to them also to the places yeah. where they can be properly taken care what of. I have, what I have noticed, very unfortunate, that sometimes the children or the particularly afflicted child was seen by competent and uh, otherwise uh, doing very well in the profession, 
but mm -hmm. not really guided the child very yes, well that where, is to very go, where to really get the treatment done that's unfortunate if you not if you are not doing the idea of very presentation of this kind is to make the people aware how mm -hmm. the treatment should be done and where the child should be referred proper referral is an integral part of yes, our yes. responsibility yes. even if we are not doing ourselves that's very that important correct, sir. Sir, Sir, this is what this is what I have learned from this uh, presentation, sir. I think a lot of learning has been done, and still we'll be learning more. Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Mandal sir. Thank you very thank much. You, thank, thank, you, you. thank you all. Thank you all for the nice webinar. Good night. Good, Good night, good everybody. Night. Good night. Thank Good you. Good night. Have a nice dinner. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, good Dr. Night. Sir. Good night. Thank good. you. Good night. Very nice. Very good. आपसे बात भी हो गया बात भी हो गया <laughs> बात और होते बात बात और होते रहेगा <laughs> होते रहेगा होते आ, रहेगा ओके गुड नाइट गुड नाइट गुड नाइट गुड नाइट एवरीवन